And we have somebody with us. Yes, we have Carlotta Perez. So, Miss Perez, the floor is yours. What I'm going to propose to you is using the history of technological revolutions to help us understand the present and, most importantly, to help us shape the future. I have five big questions to answer. What can previous technological revolutions teach us? Why do we have so much populism now? Why did we move to extreme free market ideas? What have social democrats been doing and why doesn't it work? And finally, why move towards smart, green, fair and global growth? Let's begin then with what technological revolutions can tell us. There have been five technological revolutions in 240 years. The Industrial Revolution, machines, factories and canals. The age of steam, coal and railways. Then the age of steel and heavy engineering, electrical, chemical, civil, naval. That was the first globalization because you could go from the north to the south with steamships. Then we had the age of the automobile, oil, plastics and mass production. And finally, our own age of information technology and telecommunications, which is only halfway along its path. Each brings a techno-economic and socio-institutional shift with growing inequality in the first half. And the good news is that there is a golden age in the second half. Now, just to see what that means. The historical record reveals a regular sequence of bubbles and golden ages. First, we have an installation period with growing inequality and crashes. It's a very turbulent time. And the second half, we have golden age prosperity, and it's a win-win game between business and society. However, in between, there is a turning point, which is what happens after bubbles, recessions, political unrest, populism. So we are actually at this point. We are with the possibility of having a golden age ahead. In the first revolution, there was canal mania, followed by the Great British Leap railway mania in the next, followed by the Victorian boom, many global booms in Argentina, in, in Australia, especially in the South in America, and the Gilded Age in America. Then we had the Belle Epoque and the Progressive Era. The Roaring Twenties was followed by the post-war Golden Age and the dot-com boom global casino, which we have had up to now, could be followed by a sustainable global ICT golden age. Could it? Let's hope. So the adequate parallels for today are the 1930s and World War II. And the golden ages depend on government policy providing direction. How was the mass production revolution politically shaped? Nazi fascism? Sino-Soviet Socialism and Keynesian Social Democracies. Those were the main three models in that. And how was the age of steel and heavy engineering shaped? The British had a free market empire. The Germans cartelized and unionized the economy and the Americans the Gilded Age with high protection just as much as the Germans. Technology then provides the options but society chooses the future. What directions were given by the Keynesian social democracies with a great range? Suburbanization and the Cold War with high taxes and the welfare state. So let's go to the second question. Why do we have so much populism now? Because populism is the harvesting of resentment. Installation periods destroy jobs, destroy skills, destroy industries and regions. So for many people, Times were better before, my children will be worse off, somebody must be at fault. So on the left, the culprit is capitalism, big business and the politicians. On the right, the culprits are the other countries. We have nationalism, the migrants, the Muslims, the Jews, the Mexicans, whoever, just not us. So messianic leaders represent, stoke and attract real public anger, even if they cannot deliver. So every paradigm shift leads to a realignment of the political spectrum too. 
So we have people with collective values and goals and people with individual values and goals or movements, not to call them left and right, because sometimes it just doesn't really fit the reality. But among them, there are some looking backward and some looking forward because some understand the future and some are still dreaming of their old dreams and wanting to have them happen. So the traditional parties divide and new movements emerge, as we're seeing now, the Greens and so on. And there is a shift in culture, values and aspirations. Success in business or in politics goes to those who understand and shape the new technological potential. That's the power we have in our hands. Now, why did we move to extreme free market ideas? We were so successful in the golden age. Well, because technological revolutions also result in a changing historical pattern for economic ideas. The unfettered market inequalities of the first half create pressure to bring back a proactive state in the second half. And the exhaustion of a revolution and the need for the next one at the end tend to reclaim the role of unfettered markets for the creative destruction process of the next revolution. So in our case, in the 1970s, the mass production revolution reached maturity and exhaustion. Investment along the same lines found limits and business looked for solutions. No more productivity growth, mergers, acquisitions, reject the unions they are asking for too much salaries. No more new markets, planned obsolescence, sell the same thing to everybody, import substitution abroad. No more cost reductions, well, increase prices or find low cost labor abroad. Cumbersome high data structure, use computers. Excess pollution causing problems, use electronic controls. No more reliable profits. Oh, finance invents new tricks, leads unlocked in international payments, tax havens, and looks for new countries and risky innovation. Microelectronics? Maybe that's what they did. So a revolution was dying and a different revolution was taking shape, centered on information and creating a global economy. And the advanced countries began suffering from both inflation and unemployment. So during the mass production golden age, while the Keynesian policies worked, monetarists had no hope. But in the 70s and 80s, the traditional Keynesian recipes stopped functioning. They could not pitch inflation versus unemployment because what we had was stagflation. We had both. So the stage was set for the neoliberal takeover. for the huge experiment involved in the installation of the information revolution and of a new paradigm for investment and innovation. We, the, there was this, it's, an, it's an experiment, this free market thing with new revolutions. Hence, governments actively handed the economy over to the market and the processes of polarization and inequality took off undisturbed and even facilitated. So what have social democracy been doing? Why, why doesn't it work? Well, let's measure inequality in three countries with the Palma Ratio. The Palma Ratio is a fantastic idea developed by Gabriel Palma, which allows us not only to look at the level of inequality, but also the income distribution. So if we look at Germany, South Korea, and Chile, we see that the top 10% both in Germany and South Korea, receives about a quarter of disposable income, whereas the bottom 40% receives a bit less than a quarter. But they're you know, free, and then the 50% in between receives a bit over half of disposable income. What happens in Chile, much worse, we have the top 10% receiving almost 40% and the bottom 40% under 15%. So it's a much more unequal society if we compare. So the Palma ratio in Germany and Korea is just over 1, 1 1.2. The Palma ratio, the ratio between the top 10 and the bottom 40 in, in Chile is almost three, three times. So the genies of South Korea and Germany are 32, 
the Gini of Chile much higher. So two similar, one different. Should we worry about Chile and feel good about the low inequality in the other two countries? Maybe we need to look behind appearances. The austerity and free market policies have not resulted in a fair society. Look at this. Chile and Germany, if we look at the market before taxes and transfers, we find that Germany from its Keynesian times has gone through in the free market times all the way to reach Chile in inequality in market Gini before taxes and transfers. So in market inequality outcomes, I'm sorry to say that the EU countries have now descended to levels of Latin America. Of course, social welfare policies can reestablish fairness, but at a very high cost. Look at this. It used to be that you needed to redistribute about 28% a 28 gap, whereas now the gap is 44%. It's an enormous amount of redistribution that has to be done in order to get to the same as before, disposable income around 30. So, I mean, Gini around 30. So as the gap grows wider, government income has to concentrate on overcoming market inequality instead of investing and innovating. But does this result in a dynamic and prosperous economy anyway? Well, let's see. It so happens that the extra income at the top did not lead to more investment. Look at investment as percent of GDP. It used to be 30% in Keynesian times. It is now 20% in free market times. So in fact, no matter how much money they have, they don't really invest because of that. And without enough investment and innovation, productivity inevitably declines. So look at this, the annual increase in productivity in Germany used to be around 40 or even more than 4% per year. Now it's even less than 1%. So, a weaker economy having to maintain an increasingly expensive welfare state without increasing the taxes on the richest and without providing directionality for investment and innovation, which is even more serious. So is it the same in South Korea, which was the same in terms of the Palmer ratio? No, look, only 9% difference between the market and the disposable income. That's all the redistribution they had to do because they keep inequality at EU levels with only 9% because market inequality is much lower. How about investment? Well, look, investment as share of GDP in Korea continues to be between 30 and 35% where Germans used to be. Now it's 20% in Germany. So it's gone down also in terms of uh, investment. I mean, the Korea has not gone down. And you don't need to let, inequality, to let inequality increase in order to promote investment. So it's time to abandon the myths about the benefits of unfettered free markets. We knew they were unfair. Now we know they're also inefficient. So why move towards smart, green, fair, and global growth? Golden ages are win-win games between business and society. That is the definition of social democracy precisely. And that is why social democracy is the only way out. Populism will not get anybody there. So it re but it requires both an active state and dynamic markets with a consensus strategy and coherent policies in clear and stable directions. But the policies must fit and use the current information revolution, not the previous one. So now, why smart and green? Because the energy and materials intensive, unavoidably wasteful mass production revolution is the main cause of the threats of climate change and resource depletion. So the information revolution with the intangible nature of software and of internet mobility provides the best set of tools to turn products into services and generally reverse the old trends. So smart green lifestyles and production methods must lead the way and governments should become as agile as Amazon. 
Now, why fair and global? Well, first of all, for fundamental humanitarian reasons, as well as practical ones related to peace and profitability. We're all in this together. If the rising violence, desperate migrations and populism has not convinced the world, the pandemic has. The post-war boom in the advanced world was the result of a fair income distribution in the North that created dynamic demand for profitable business. But to pay high salaries, oil and materials had to be kept cheap, which helped the underdeveloped countries behind. Now, full global development is now the best way to expand demand. The world needs expensive fossil fuels and materials to make sustainability the more profitable direction for innovation. Consumer goods have become commodities. Future profitable innovation is in services, new materials, food, capital goods, and so on. Development across the lagging world will improve the lives of millions in the global south, will reduce local wars and desperate migrations, will create demand for sustainable capital goods in the global north. So intelligent globalization is intelligent specialization and globalization. You both have the local and the global and one for the other and the other for the one with a balanced distribution of production across the planet. The current leadership has the opportunity to unleash a global sustainable golden age, providing a context with clear directions and missions, favoring production and definancializing the economy. It's absolutely urgent to definancialize the economy while rethinking Keynes plus Schumpeter and being as bold and imaginative as those who set up the Bretton Woods system. The deployment of smart, green, fair, and global growth can be a positive sum game between business and society, between advanced, emerging, and developing countries, and between humanity and the planet. And the post-pandemic reconstruction is probably the best moment to do so. Thank you.